friends, it's Sarah the Tudor Travel Guide here and welcome back to this month's episode of the Tudor Travel Guide's A to Z of Tudor Places. Today we are visiting the venerable city of Rochester in Kent and in particular the now lost priory of St Andrews which was the scene of one of the most infamous meetings of the Tudor age. Because my friends, as you are probably aware, it was here that the ageing Henry VIII of England first laid eyes on his bride-to-be, Anne of Cleves. Now sadly, as we all know, this first encounter did not end well. In fact, before it had even begun, the relationship was doomed. And although Henry did in fact marry Anne, he appeared to do so under some considerable duress, as the accounts of the period attest. But before we go on any further with our story, I would just like to say that if you are enjoying this video and indeed this channel, please do hit the like button. And if you're not already, maybe subscribe to my channel. And that way, of course, you'll be notified when any new videos of mine go live. Okay, well, it's back to our story. Anne of Cleves' journey to England took her through some simply atrocious winter weather, particularly when she arrived in northern France and was awaiting to cross into England. The journey overall had taken her about six weeks to travel from her homeland in the northwest of modern day Germany to England, where she had been due to meet with Henry at Greenwich, the place in which they would be subsequently married. However, on New Year's Day 1540, Anne would be ambushed by a monarch rejuvenated by the prospect of meeting his future bride. He simply could not contain himself. And the encounter is well known, of course, and recorded in more than one contemporary source. And here I'm going to quote from the Imperial Ambassador Eustace Shapwe, who gives, in fact, his second hand account of just what happened. He describes that the king, and I quote, came secretly to Rochester and so went up into the chamber where the said Lady Anne was looking out of a window to see the bull baiting, which was going on in the courtyard below. And suddenly he embraced and kissed her and showed her a token which the king had sent for her, a New Year's gift. Of course, it was New Year's Day. And she, being abashed and not knowing who it was, thanked him, and so he spoke with her. But she regarded him little, but always looked out of the window. And when the king saw that she took so little notice of his coming, he went into another chamber and took off his cloak and came in again in a purple cloak of velvet. And when the lords and knights saw his grace, they did reverence. And then Her Grace humbled herself lowly to the King's Majesty. Yes, I bet she did. <laughs> and His Grace saluted her again, and they talked together lovingly. And afterwards he took her by the hand and led her to the another chamber, where their graces amused themselves that night, and on Friday until the afternoon. A little bit awkward, would you not say? It did not bode well for a happy future. Henry was not one to be shunned, even if it was completely inadvertently. And in fact, until this point, praise for the Lady Anne's appearance and countenance had been fulsome from all sides. And indeed, Henry had expressed no qualms on seeing Holbein's earlier portrait of Anne. In fact, we have to wonder about how true this first encounter was, because the adverse testimonies of the event seem mainly to be dated to June and July of 1540, when the evidence was to be used during the divorce proceedings, which of course Henry had instigated, and was being gathered from eyewitnesses and courtiers close to the king. And this included the thy, by then disgraced Thomas Cromwell, Earl of Essex, who was languishing at the Tower of the King's Mercy. Cromwell, though, recorded his recollections of the King's first impressions of his bride-to-be. 
After that, your majesty heard that the Lady Anne was arrived at Dover, and that her journeys were appointed towards Greenwich, and that she should be at Rochester on New Year's Eve. At night, your grace repaired towards night to Greenwich, where I spake with your grace, and demanded of you how you liked the Lady Anne. Your grace, being somewhat heavy as I took it, answered and said she was no such manner of woman as she had been declared to you, with many other things. He was not a happy man. But, as ever, being the Tudor travel guide, I love to know where events took place, so let's talk a little bit about that. Well, Anne was, as I have suggested, lodged in the abbot's lodgings, which was part of the then Priory of St Andrews in Rochester. In the mid-16th century, at the time of Anne's visit, Rochester was still a typical medieval walled city, and it was situated to the banks of the River Medway, a, a, major, uh, a, a major thoroughfare, a major river of the time. Within these city walls, and adjacent to the great Norman castle, whose keep can still be seen today and which dominates the town, you would have found the Priory of St Andrews and it was historically home to the bishops of Rochester. And like many medieval monastic complex, the thriving community was centred around the cathedral, which again of course exists still today. There was also the main Priory Gate or Great Gatehouse just adjacent to the west doors of the cathedral and that gave entry into the outer courtyard or curia of the monastery. And directly ahead of that gatehouse across the courtyard was the Bishop's Palace, which was last regularly inhabited by Bishop John Fisher. He had of course been executed for treason in 1535. What we do know from an inventory taken after Bishop Fisher's death was that the building was clearly substantial. We also know that the fabric had been sorely neglected, even by the mid-1520s, when Fisher's great friend Erasmus visited him at the palace and he wrote a letter describing how he felt it was a cold and uncomfortable habitation, not good for the health. The exact layout of the Bishop's Palace is unknown. Perhaps all that can be said with certainty is that it ran along almost the entire south side of the Curia, with the privy apartments being on the first floor, as we might expect from any significant privy lodgings. And in fact, that is confirmed when we hear in that account from Eustace Shapwee how the king went up into the chamber where the said Lady Anne was looking out of a window to see the bull baiting going on in the courtyard below. Now finally, a fun fact for you. You might not know that in fact Jane Seymour also visited Rochester alongside Henry VIII during the short summer progress of 1536. Now this is a significant progress because it was the only one undertaken by Jane when she was Queen. It was a simple and very short progress to Dover from London and back again. But of course by the next summer, which would typically when the court would go on progress, Jane was heavily pregnant and awaiting the birth of her child and of course sadly she would subsequently die. The location of the royal lodgings, the lodgings in which Henry and Jane stayed, sadly is not recorded in contemporary records, but presumably these were the same ones that Anne of Cleves would make use of four years later. Now I know you love to get on the road whenever you can, so what about if you want to visit and see these locations for yourself? Well, you may well arrive at Rochester by crossing the River Medway, and if you do, you will be struck by the magnificent Norman keep of the castle, which of course sits directly across from the cathedral. It simply dominates the skyline and looks much as it did when it was constructed about 900 years ago. Now, if you make your way to the cathedral and stand at the west doors, if you turn right and walk straight ahead of you, you will be walking towards a range of buildings which sit behind some iron railings. 
and if you look carefully at one of those buildings you will see evidence of medieval brickwork and this gives you some hint of its medieval past. It is in fact all that remains today of the Bishop of Rochester's lodgings and if you are in any doubt about where you are a stone plaque helpfully affixed to the aforementioned gate and wall reminds those who care to look at it that, and I quote, here lived for 31 years John Fisher, Bishop of Rochester, Chancellor of the University of Cambridge and Cardinal, who lay down his life for his faith on Tower Hill, June the 22nd, 1535. And if this is indeed the remains of Anne's lodgings in Rochester, then by deduction you are quite possibly standing right in the courtyard where my Lady of Cleves watched the bear being baited while Henry VIII of England unsuccessfully vied for her attention. And it is a strange feeling indeed to be standing in a place where a future Queen of England's fate was sealed before she had hardly even uttered a word. Okay, well, that is all for this month's A to Z of Tudor Places. Do make sure to look out for next month's episode where we will be tackling the letter S and it is one of my favourites, my friends. So until we meet again on our virtual Tudor road trip around England, all that remains for me to say as ever is, happy time travelling. Mm -hmm.